Good evening, esteemed guests and lovely members of the virtual audience. I'm elated to welcome you all to the session of Oran City Literature Fest 2020, organized by the SGR Knowledge Foundation. I am Anushi Jain, the anchor for this session. The topic for this session is how COVID changed world sport. And our guest speaker for this session is Saboria Majumdar. He is a Rhodes Scholar, is the author of multiple books in Indian sports and its history. His most recent work, 11 Gods and a Billion Indians, was awarded the Rabindra Pushkar for Literature in 2018. He is a Senior Research Fellow at the University of Central Lancashire and Adjunct Professor, Munash Muna Muna University, Melbourne. He also serves as Consulting Editor of Sports for the India Today Group. It's an honor to welcome you, sir, to this discussion today. Thank you. In the next 40 minutes, sir will be in a conversation with Ma'am Sangeeta Verma, who is a company secretary by profession. She was an adjunct lecturer in the Institute of Chartered Financial Analysts of India for its MBA course. She had authored for ICFAI two editions of its curriculum textbook on economic legislation covering company law, few general laws, and direct and indirect taxation. She has also worked as a project manager with end-to-end -end responsibility of managing a hospital project. In her free time, she lends her support for environmental causes and is currently working at saving the beautiful but fast disappearing granite rocks of Hyderabad. She is the Joint Secretary of the Society to Save Rocks and is an active member of VLOG, a trust working in the fields of rape and sexual abuse, police reforms, and environment-related issues. We're pleased to welcome you in this conversation, ma'am. Thank I you. Now, I now hand it over to you to take this conversation forward. Thank you, Anush. The global outbreak of COVID-19 left all of us in a real shock. Everything came to a standstill, confining us to our own spaces. People in the sporting world who actually had a very strict training and exercise regime uh, started to lose their agility, their speed, and their shape. Not just this, the pandemic also affected all the collaborators of the sporting events. To help us understand how COVID changed world sports, I am in conversation with Gorya Majumdar, whom I consider as a living encyclopedia. Not because he is a sports journalist, but because of the extent of the search that he has done in sports and particularly in cricket. Hello, Gorya, and welcome to this conversation. I am extremely happy that you recovered from COVID and you're here to join us then. Thank you. Before we move on to the topic of our conversation, I'd like to ask you a couple of introductory questions. Uh, going back to your research, your thesis, 22 yards to success, uh, social history of Indian cricket, did it in any way help further cricket in India? See, I wouldn't be able to answer that. I mean, I started out uh, as, as an academic uh, trying to understand, frankly, I wouldn't be able to do a PhD on anything else but this subject, because as you very well know, I mean, PhD is a very lonely experience. Uh, you live with that subject more than you live with your wife. So for me, uh, that isolating and lonely experience was only possible with cricket, because that's some, so if I feel bored, what do I do? I watch cricket. If I feel down, like I was over over the past week, uh, you know, when fever and body ache and all kinds of things were happening to me, what was I doing? I was watching cricket on my phone. So for me, cricket is 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 a microcosm of life, right? So that was the only subject I was perhaps good enough to do a PhD in. And uh, having uh, got the roads in 1999, uh, then went to Oxford, to St. John's, things opened up for me. And, and most importantly, I think I was riding a wave. I think I was riding the cricket globalization commercialism wave. But just about the same time that I was embarking on this uh, doctoral dissertation, if you see money came in, globalization happened, match fixing happened, and post that, everything changed as far as world cricket and Indian cricket is concerned. So things really fell in place for me. I mean, and as they say, timing 
timing is essential to sport. So I was perhaps there at the right time when things opened up for me. Whether it has impacted Indian sport or not, I don't know. But it has definitely impacted uh, studies on Indian sport. Because if you see now, it is more or less a very common and popular subject, whether it's the IIMs, whether it is the IIS, WBMs, whether it is colleges, whether it is undergraduate courses, Indians wanting to study sport, not simply cricket, be it football, be it the, the economics of sport. There's been a lot of research since. And that, I think, has been one of the most important uh, you know, results uh, which has come out of uh, my own work. And I think there's still lots to be done because if you really want to understand contemporary India, I mean, take take uh, what has happened with the IPL, uh, it, you know, braved market estimates, look at the robustness of the brand that it got more money than anybody would have envisaged. So I yeah. think there's plenty more research that can be done on sport and plenty more people will do that going forward. Oh, that's wonderful. In your growing up years, were you more on the field or you were away researching and writing articles for your school and college magazine? See, I always wanted to play. I was never good enough. I mean, I played under 15 for the Cricket Association of Bengal. I played table tennis and represented Bengal, uh, you know, but that was all. I mean, never good enough to make it uh, to the next level. So it was always the best thing to do to try and analyze. And that's what I did. I mean, I, as I said, I lived the sport. I, I watched, and not simply cricket, I've actually sort of, you know, watched sport from the age of, what, three or four? I used to go, all my all my abuse has been picked up in football grounds. So I used to go and stand at the ramparts of the Mohun Bagan ground in Calcutta. And uh, every school day, I mean, my school would end around, what, 1.30, 2 o'clock? And the Calcutta Football League would start at 3. So from school, I'll straight go there, stand in the queue, which would stretch for a couple of kilometers, buy my ticket and get in. So for me, sport was life. And parents allowed me to do it. Uh, you know, there were people at home who would who would encourage me to do it, and and all kinds of sport, be it cricket, be it football, be it hockey, be it be it Olympic sport, be it kite flying, be it chess, be it Ludo, be it uh, cards. I did everything. You know, I had a fulfilling childhood with sport, and that's what it is. I mean, for me, sport is that's it, what is it? It's the opiate of the masses. It's life. So you know, just love it. Oh my. I didn't know that you could play or you have played so many sports uh, in your life. Uh, that's just fantastic. So I'm sure we can look forward to many more, uh, you know, researches and books on not just cricket, but other uh, sporting events as well. Um, it's a matter of time, a few weeks, that 2020 is going to be over. And perhaps it would be remembered as one of the most difficult years in the recent time where we saw millions lose their loved and dear ones. And uh, millions saw their lives undergo a sea change for reasons that were completely out of the control. And the sporting world also suffered enough. So let's talk of the effect of the COVID uh, on the various stakeholders, starting with the uh, players themselves. How did it affect their mental and physical health and how did just share a few uh, you know interactions that you've had with the players at the IPL how did it feel while playing in a bio bubble that's a very good question i mean if you really see let's let's divide it into two parts one cricket and the other is olympic sport yes obviously tokyo was supposed to be in july of this year earlier this year and it got postponed. I mean, Japan and the Olympics have a very weird relationship, isn't it? I mean, 1940 Tokyo Games got postponed because of the Second World War. Again, Tokyo Games got postponed because of COVID. Uh, so anyone and everyone who's preparing for the Olympic Games, I mean, you prepare for that one centennial okay. moment under the sun for four years, and then all of a sudden it is robbed from you. It's, it's a weird moment. It's very difficult to understand what athletes go through. While some benefited, for example, if somebody who had an injury will now be able to participate in 21, most people sort of really time their peak accordingly so that they can participate and make a difference at the Olympic Games. So from that standpoint, it was a huge blow, huge blow. I mean, mentally and physically. All of a sudden, look, in my 44 years, I've never seen live sport come to a standstill. This was the first time. I actually went into depression because I thought the kind of work that I did, so does it have any value? So, for example, in April, uh, there was no live sport. 
when I switched on the television, it was all about past games and past stuff. And yes. I was like, so the kind of stuff that I do, analyze sport, will I ever be able to do it again? Has my life been taken away from me? What does this mean? Uh, will the world ever come back? And then gradually, you know, first it was the German Football League, the Bundesliga. First time we started hearing about things like a bio bubble and what is it and we need to create a bio bubble. And I was very closely in conversation with Saurabh Ganguly, the BCCI president. Again, he's from Calcutta. I'm from Calcutta. Yeah. And we were starting to talk that, okay, can we do an IPL? Can the BCCI push for an IPL? Nobody really knew because uh, the IPL involves so many different teams, so many different constituents. It's a multinational tournament in the sense people from across the world would congregate. So nobody really knew whether we can go ahead or not. But then England, West Indies happened. It was bilateral. But for the first time, we understood, okay, this is how a bio bubble is created. You create a sanctified biosecure environment and you put players there and you test them every three days and you can actually pull off a cricket tournament. And England did that with the football league. Germany did that. Serie A did it. You know, uh, Spanish league happened. And then the England West Indies series happened. And all of a sudden, people started gaining in confidence and people started thinking, oh, you know what? We can still do it. I mean, we can start to learn with COVID. We can start to learn with creating these bio bubbles. Yes, uh, within a bio bubble, it's very difficult. And what does a bio bubble entail? A bio bubble, uh, it's very easy to know or hear, you know, that we are watching the IPL, but for the players, it's mighty hard. So when you go there, you can't take Australia. At the moment, uh, when the Indians went there, for the first 14 days, they were not allowed to step out of their rooms. So they cleaned their own yeah. bathrooms. All the, yeah. the housekeeping staff would do would come and leave the bathroom cleaner outside the door. That's it. So you would clean your own sheets. You would clean your own uh, toilets. You would clean your own beds. You would clean your everything. The, the food would come in plastic containers, in plastic cutlery. And that's how you would survive. The only time you would meet your players, that too they got special permission, was during practice. And when the coaches would meet is one-on-one -on -one in the physio's room. And the rest of the meetings would happen on Zoom, would happen on WebEx, would happen on all these technological platforms. So that's how the bio bubble operated. And for the IPL, every second or third day, the players would be tested. Now, imagine about 12, 1300 people getting tested every second, third day. It was a humongous exercise. Having said that, the BCCI managed to pull it off. And a 5,000 crore industry got the, the injection of life. So for me, it was one of the most amazing administrative feats that the Indian Cricket Board managed to do. What impact did it have on the mental health of players? You will not understand it now. To move from one bubble to another bubble, like the Indians did or the Australians did, is mighty hard. That is why I think players will now need to pick and choose. They can't play all tournaments and all series and all games because you cannot have a whole 365 days in a bio bubble. Having said that, we now know vaccines will come. We now know therapeutics will come. So this is only a transitional period of four or five months. I think sport has learned to live with COVID. Sport has learned how to survive and take things on. But the bio bubble will have an impact on the mental health of players. And that's something we've got to be concerned of. Uh, you know, it, it is perhaps the first time in 75 years that one of the biggest tennis tournaments, the Wimbledon Championship, was cancelled. Uh, while some, which were played a little, little later, like the French Open, etc., they postponed. Even the Tokyo, as you mentioned earlier, Tokyo Olympics, it has been postponed for 2021. I have two uh, questions in relation to the cancellation and the postponement. One is, did the world rating and ranking of the players, the athletes, and the sports persons be affected by the cancellation of the postponement? Or was it a boon for some? Secondly, uh, was there any fallback reason for the AELTC to actually cancel the championship? So what made them take this hard decision? See, at a time when they cancelled the championship, England was going through the worst. I mean, uh, around March, April, when COVID really hit, we know how bad it was in the UK, and it was very justified that uh, SW19 would do what they did. So I don't think that's a bad call. At the same time, they had COVID insurance, they had pandemic insurance, so they didn't lose out on money. Uh, having said that, in terms of rankings, no, nothing impacted, because uh, most of the international federations, and here's not only tennis, most of the international federations decided to stop test events whether it is qualifying events for the Olympics, whether it is other events, they tried, they tried to stop. Why? 
and it was very important. For example, China had COVID under control from March. So if these events would have continued, certain countries would have benefited ahead of others. Even today, China stands to benefit because China's got it under control. Certain other countries like New Zealand has it under control. Australia has it under control. So certain countries will always have more advantage than the others because of COVID, given the kind of impact it has had in different countries. And China stands to benefit the most. So it was important for international federations to sort of cancel test events and freeze rankings or qualification processes so that the level playing field is not impacted uh, uh, badly. It will be, it will still be because certain countries people can train while the others people can't. So individual athletes can train while others can't. All these things will happen. now. How do you how do you address these things? You, there's no straitjacket answer. Having said that, there's at least to a degree now most countries know how to deal with it and create biosecure environments for their athletes to start training, including India. So one would expect 21 to be much better with most of these athletes who are participating, whether it's an Olympic Games or a Nation Games or a World Championship, starting to train and starting to take center stage. You're talking of the biosecure uh, atmosphere. Let's talk of the Tokyo. Olympic and Paralympic Games, uh, which will start on 23rd July 2021. Uh, how are they going to address two issues? One is the health angle and the other the financial implications of having postponed for about a year. How, I'm not talking of the athletes who are going to be there because for obvious reasons, they're going to be the first in line to be vaccinated. And But there, there are, you know, it's going to be a gamut of people who support uh, and help bring this whole event together and ensure that it is held and concluded successfully and now very safely. How How is this going to be handled? From what I know, and, and uh, there's a report including, uh, you know, today that uh, Japan wants spectators, that's number one. Uh, they will insist on COVID negative tests. So anybody who lands in Tokyo will have to have a COVID negative test within the last 48 to 72 hours, which is going to be the norm from what I understand, and it's very fair. I think they will also insist on uh, personal COVID insurance, health insurance for every individual who's traveling to Japan for the Olympics. So they will uh, have to have uh, personal health insurance, including fans. I think uh, there will be some kind of vaccination process also. For example, if you have an Olympic ticket, you will be considered frontline in a way and will have to get vaccinated. Like, for example, when we went to Brazil, uh, to Brazil, we had to get the, the yellow fever Tika. We had to get the Zika stuff. So all of these things will be put in place. I know there was a meeting between uh, Thomas Bach and the WHO head, uh, uh, you know, Tedros. Uh, I'm sure the WHO and the International Olympic Committee will put mechanisms in place and uh, Tokyo will happen. At this point in time, I don't envisage Tokyo not happening. Number two, I do envisage Tokyo happening with fans, which I think will be massive. Number three, I think by then, which is July, the world will be vaccinated. At least this section, uh, people who are stakeholders of Tokyo or will travel to Tokyo will certainly be vaccinated because there's a report which says there'll be about eight to 10 vaccines by summer. There's no reason to believe that two, 300,000 people, which is hardly anything, uh, will, will not get vaccinated uh, before they, they go to Tokyo. So I think the Olympics will happen. To what extent will it be a full Olympics in terms of fans for every event, et cetera? We've got to wait and see. I pick on two aspects of the fans that you have spoken of. Uh, I was uh, looking at uh, the uh, website of uh, the uh, Tokyo Olympic and Paralympic Games, and I found a very interesting segment there. It's, uh, it allows the fans to interact and have an online experience with their sporting icon. Uh, you can register and uh, book your slot and have a chat with them. Uh, you know, and share the same stream state. Do you think this is going to become a norm before any other uh, big sporting event? See, these are commercial mechanisms. I mean, for example, during the Olympic Games, will will an athlete want to interact? The answer is no. But these things will happen because technology at one level, I think, has enriched world sport. I mean, I think uh, using COVID, we now know that uh, sporting fandom can be much more democratic than what it was in the past. I mean, fandom has been completely transformed as a result of COVID. Uh, I'll give you an example. I mean, when, for example, India is playing in Australia and you are you're sitting in Hyderabad, Anushri is sitting in Nagpur, I'm sitting in Calcutta. Uh, in normal circumstances, you and I would only consume it on television. But now, thanks to COVID, 
uh, what these broadcasters have done is it has you know some of them have empowered uh, these fans sitting in different parts of the world with uh, virtual fan walls and uh, you can live tweet a video uh, which you take so if you and your your you know partner is watching a particular game at home all you need to do is record that video real time and send it so you are actually getting empowered you are being given an agency as a result of which the fan dumb that we talk about is getting much more democratic which was not the case earlier and that i think is a fallout of covid which will 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 enrich and help world sport because at one level the sponsor is reaching out to a far wider audience uh, fandom is getting democratic it is no longer confined to the confines of the stadium the 25000 30000 40000 whatever it is so in that sense we will come out way better than where we were because i think there was a sense of complacency in the past where like everything there was a straight jacket formula a is equal to b is equal to c and that's how sports broadcast is i think everything now has changed for example i'm sitting and commentating uh, from home for the hero indian super league i commentated for the indian premier league now think about it i am actually being relayed a signal from dubai real time i'm talking on that signal that is being broadcast back to bombay and then it is being aired to the world and all of this is happening in a matter of seconds okay. so you are actually hearing it real time live broadcast live commentary and i'm talking to pictures this was unthinkable about 6 or 7 months back uh, because of covid this has been made possible now think of this you can now immediately say that i will save money i will not uh, spend more on travel i so if i was asked to travel to a biosecure bubble and stay there for 70 80 days i have a 71 year old mom and a 6 7 6 year old daughter i would say no so immediately you are giving people the comfort of working from within the confines of home so all of these things as a result you know has changed and and that i think is the biggest technological advance that the world has seen the sporting world has seen because of covid and that i think is a big big plus going forward how does it relate in terms of financial gains for all these stakeholders it's a huge financial gain for example um, if for example take star i mean star decided to broadcast in what eight nine languages during ipl now you did not need to take your commentators from all languages to a particular uh, venue in dubai or to bombay uh, to biosecure environments you could do home commentary you could do virtual commentary you could do online i mean uh, sponsors at the same time every different language broadcast means you are catering to a different kind of uh, commercial establishment the multiple companies which cater to multiple audiences would immediately come within the fold of this broadcast so th- there's no question that economically this is something that has benefited sport and will benefit sport going forward so n- look i don't think sport will ever stop now that's the biggest plus to come out of it because we now know we can do remote commentary all you need to do and it includes contact sports or any kind of sport all you need to do is create a biosecure bubble you put the athletes there you put testing there you have uh, people tested you create that that uh, straight jacketed norm which is now known to the world look at look at it now today morning you had new zealand play west indies in a t20 you had australia play india in a 50 over game and you are now watching england play south africa in a t20 so six teams playing in one particular day this is international cricket in calcutta there's a local tournament going on the bengal t20 which is also being broadcast right so if you really in bangladesh they are doing their own domestic t20 competition pakistan is doing their own domestic t20 competition so look at the number of games that are happening now in different parts of the world so that i think is 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 the takeaway people have now learned how to do sport within biosecure formulas and 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 stuff like that and economically obviously all of these games have takers right that is why they are happening each of these games have a sponsor each of these games have an economic constituency each yeah. of these games have broadcast so you can understand how big the the sporting economy will be post covid are there any other takeaways positive takeaways from covid as far as positive COVID. positive takeaways is 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 our understanding of technology i think we have now learned that technology can be harnessed in a far far better manner than it ever was i mean it has broken down the complacency that all of us had gotten ourselves into it has shown what can be done 
with broadcast, which I think is the essence of sport, because ultimately the world of sports survives on broadcast because that's where the money is. I mean, it's not about anything else but broadcast money that sustains the IPL, right? It's the star sports revenue that BCCI sort of uh, survives on. So uh, Olympic Games, I mean, the kind of money that an NBC will pay in the United States will be X billion dollars. Now that's what will sustain Tokyo 2021. So that I think is the singularly important takeaway or, or, or a benefit that uh, you can harness technology in a manner that was not done before. Coming to athletes, yes, there are certain benefits in the sense, uh, take our very own. I mean, uh, athletes have now been given a little bit more time to train in your own city. I was having a chat with Gopi the other day and he says, India hasn't lost out in any manner. Some of our badminton stars had niggling injuries. They will now have the time to recuperate and convalesce and come back stronger. So yes. these are important moments. Uh, mentally also, people will be able to make adjustments. On the other hand, take somebody like a Mary Com. She'll be one year older. Can she make it? Will that impact her Olympic chances? These are important questions that neither of us have any definitive answers to yet. Right. Uh, talking of communication and talking of the technology advancements that uh, have been in the process, uh, do you think the pandemic uh, reduced uh, one great aspect of the sporting world that is match fixing, or did it increase the online betting? See, firstly, let's let's make a difference between betting and fixing. Betting, I think, is fine. I mean, I, I absolutely don't think betting is a problem. Uh, if you are in the UK or in any part of the world where betting is legal, go bet. I mean, that's that's not an issue. For example, Betfair, 365, Australia, uh, but these countries, betting is legal. So what is the issue there? Fixing is the problem. Spot fixing is the problem. Will there ever be an answer to spot fixing? No, because uh, take these leagues, take the Bangladesh League, for example. If somebody decides to block three balls of the 17th over, how on earth are you supposed to stop it? But Without spectators, I think uh, physical proximity rather, because these biosecure bubbles are genuinely biosecure. Players will not be able to meet outside people. And all of these contacts will have to happen on uh, digital or technology. So I think in that sense, outside interference will be lim you know, limited or minimized. So that's not too bad a uh, uh, fallout. Uh, at the same time, people's digital consumption will increase. So players will have to be more responsible in terms of advances from unwanted people in the digital platform and report such advances ASAP. So I think such kind of things did happen during IPL, which passed off without any hindrance. You know, frankly, I'm not too fussed about these things of match fixing, etc. because with sport, with high value commercial sport, such things will be there. But if a player is an idiot, then he has to suffer. I mean, uh, take an IPL player. If you play five years of the IPL, you will earn money that 10 generations will survive on. Now, if you decide to blow that and fix a ma match and want to make a fast buck, then in simple terms, you're an absolute jackass. Now, if you if you are that, then you then you suffer. Simple as that. So that's how I look at it. If somebody who's who's as dumb to go and fix a match, having a great career in front deserves to suffer, I don't think there are too many like that. So before uh, we move on to the uh, audience question and answers, I wanted to ask you would your next project be uh, woman centric like the Indian women's cricket? I know Mitali is your great friend. That's why I'm asking the question. She is. She is. She's a very, 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 very dear friend. Uh, Mitali, Julan, Shmriti, all of these girls, Mitali especially and Julan, they are family to me. Uh, having said that, I still don't think uh, I'm equipped enough to write a monograph on Indian women's sport per se. Uh, women's sport is something that is very, very deeply embedded in my heart in terms of uh, research interest. And I will continue to research. So maybe academic articles on the subject, but not a book. Uh, my next book is actually going to come out in January, rather February. Uh, it's a co-authored work. Uh, 1971, according to me, you know, completely transformed the vista of Indian cricket because India beat England in England and West Indies in the West Indies. And we saw the birth of a legend called Sunil Gavaskar. 
We learned how to play fast bowling. We learned that India could beat teams like England and West Indies. And it's the 50th anniversary of the 1971 Twin Victories. Right. So that's the next book. Uh, HarperCollins is publishing it. It should be out in about January, February. The book uh, is being proofread and copy edited at this point in time as we speak. And it's a big book. I mean, that sort of sustained me during COVID because I, I actually wrote between March, April, May, June, July. Uh, during lockdown, that would be my routine. So as I said, sport sustained me. That's the next book. And post that, we will see because there's plenty more to do. You know, the Olympics coming up. Uh, my book on the Olympics got published earlier this year. Uh, it was co-authored with my friend Nalin Mehta. I need to see how India does. For example, I'm predicting on your show today that uh, in terms of uh, the Paralympic Games, India will win at least 10 plus medals. So it will be a revolution. Uh, in, in Rio, we won four. I'm saying we will win at least 10 to 12 medals in the Paralympic Games in Tokyo. Now, if that happens, it's a real, real, real revolution. In terms of the Olympics, I'm still hoping that India will win about seven or eight. If India does win anywhere between six to eight medals, that will be our best showing ever. So that will prompt many, you know, articles and research. So we've got to wait and see how things unfold. All right. So can we uh, take some questions from the audience? Of course. Uh, what do you think about the government and governing bodies sending players to different countries during this pandemic? Thoughts on T20 Cricket World Cup being cancelled for IPL, which wasn't even conducted in India? Okay, you've asked me two. I mean, firstly, the, the, the second one is the easier one. The World T20 getting cancelled has nothing to do with the IPL, number one. Uh, the World T20 was was uh, the International Cricket Council's decision, and it involves 15 different countries going into Australia, which had very strict quarantine rules, including hard quarantine. So it was only natural that it would get cancelled. And the IPL is all said and done a domestic tournament governed by the BCCI. The rules were very different compared to the World T20. There was no hard lockdown or hard quarantine in Dubai. So it was it was fine. I mean, and, and anybody who has a problem with the IPL being a commercially successful enterprise can go, you know, just he, he or she doesn't know sport. I mean, ultimately, without the money, ultimately, without the moolah that the IPL rakes in, it, it will be impossible. I mean, look at the economy, look at the sporting economy and let's celebrate and support the IPL. Anyone who criticized the, the tournament because it's a commercially successful enterprise is the biggest enemy that sport can have. So that's my straight answer as far as that one is concerned. The number second one, Bajrang Punia, for example, his trip got approved yesterday. Kiran Rijiju tweeted, Bajrang, by the way, Bajrang and Sangeeta Fogart got uh, uh, married. So yes. congratulations to them. And uh, Bajrang's uh, US trip is very important. It is also a personal decision whether you want to travel or not. If you do want to, then your government needs to back you. Because ultimately, five, six months down the line, seven months down the line, we will have Tokyo. And, you know, I was actually speaking to Mr. Gavaskar the other night, and I said, you are quite, uh, uh, you're traveling quite a bit, uh, Sunny Bhai. You're in, he was in London the night before, and now on his way to Australia to commentate. And he said, look, airports are, are emptier. You can actually manage if you follow COVID protocols. So that is the other side, you know, the way you have to look at things. So I, as I told you, uh, I don't think sport will ever again come to a standstill. And individual athletes now need to create their own templates and own routines and own bubbles and start getting ready for Tokyo. Because if you ultimately come and tell me in Tokyo, oh, you know what, the Chinese got better prepared because they had no COVID, all that is nonsense. Just face the world as it is and do your best and try and see what you can do because nobody will listen to any excuses because all of us are in the same boat. The other question that has come up is athletes weren't able to practice for months. How will it impact the quality of uh, their performance in the future? Oh, now they can. I mean, yes, they, they weren't able to practice for months. And, and, uh, for example, if you see the start of the IPL, people were overweight and people were rusty and all of that. Even now, I mean, the way Indian team playing today, uh, they've just played 250 over games in the last nine months and you can see the bowlers, they're still struggling. But with time, all of that will become okay. All they've played is T20 cricket. Australia has played 50 over cricket. England has. Some of the other countries have. They've got a head start. But with time, all of these things will even out. I mean, that's what I said. Because athletes will now start 
training. We'll have to start training if they want to perform in Tokyo or in a major cricket series. So come the Cricket World Cup next year in October in India, if somebody says, oh, you know what, because of COVID, I couldn't train for five months. So what? Now the whole world knows how to do it. You create your own, own environment and go train. I mean, if you don't want to, that's your problem. I mean, uh, look, there will be somebody who will put his or her hand up and that person will win. So it is now upon the individual athlete to push himself. Mitali Raj traveled from Hyderabad to Bangalore, hired her own trainer, created yes. her own bio bubble and went and trained for the for yes. the women's t20 now nobody told her to do that she right. did that because she wanted to excel that's how you've got to do it right so uh during the pandemic uh, i mean you know there has been good support for bigger events like the ipl how would the other sports like kabaddi and you know hockey and uh, the, the not not so popular one um uh, what about those athletes? How did how have they been coping with this whole situation? See, hockey, the International Hockey Federation and the Indian Hockey Association, rather Hockey India, they are a solid body. It it to a degree depends on the nature of the federation that you have at the helm, you know, because ultimately the athletes are responsibilities of the federation to a degree. For example, the BCCI is responsible for cricket, All India Football Federation for football, Hockey India for hockey. And Hockey India is, is a strong body. I mean, whether it's Narendra Batra who was at the head uh, and, and they have money, they have resources and they will be fine. But some of the some of the relatively uh, weaker associations, I'm worried about those athletes, whether it's volleyball, whether it's uh, gymnastics, whether it's uh, uh, some of those athletes. Kabaddi, Yes, because one, uh, it's a body contact sport. Second, do they have the money? Do they have the wherewithal? And there the sports ministry will have to step up and create the, the protocols. What about uh, para-athletes? Because their requirements and body requirements will be fundamentally different compared to able-bodied athletes. We have to be far more sensitive to the requirements of para-athletes. These are challenging times. But with time, with uh, you know, uh, uh, things getting starting to get better, I think people will evolve their own mechanism. Does that mean that Tokyo 2021 will not happen in terms of Paralympics? Absolutely not. I think it will happen. And I also think India, for example, my friend Devendra Jajari has already started to train. He's going for his third gold medal. That's why I made that prediction that India will win more than 10 medals. So all said and done, it's a very unnatural year. It will never happen in our lifetimes, hopefully. It's a one year, hundred year, once in a hundred year phenomenon. But that's what it is because we are now coming out of COVID. Post-COVID world, world sport will look different. Technologically different, monetarily different, democratically, the fandom has, or the quality of fandom will have changed. And more importantly, when things do get normal, when all of us are vaccinated, you will see revenge buying in the sense, revenge travel. You will see people consuming sport inside stadiums like crazy. So all of these things will happen in 21, which I think is a better year. But how did the uh, sports persons of not so popular sporting uh, event, uh, sporting uh, field, I mean, how did they survive? Uh, uh, were they supported by their boards, the confederation or the government? To a degree, yes. I mean, we we also saw some voluntary efforts. Uh, even don't only talk about uh, you know re relatively peripheral sports. We beyond the elite sports person for even cricket or beyond the elite sports person for even football. The B layer, the C layer, the D layer, they belong to the same category. Take the groundsmen, take the Malis, take the yes. uh, pitch rollers, take the the, the club footballer, the, the local footballer. So all of these people, the, the sporting economy has taken a hit. So I, I saw uh, Seka Somdev Dev Varman and uh, Mahesh Bhupati and uh, Rohan Mopanna take a serious amount of you know effort in tennis. There were these individual efforts going from athletes who are elite athletes to try and help the second or the third rung. So there were these individual efforts. There were, you know, obviously Kiran Rijiju and his ministry has tried to do extraordinarily good work. Sports Authority of India tried to do its best. So people from everywhere tried to pull in and that's how it has to be. You know, it, the situation is not perfect. Even today it is not perfect. And all of us know that. Within this, we've got to make do with what we have. And more importantly, think of where you were in March. Think of where you are on the 29th of November at 1840 hours. You have sport 
every kind of sport cricket football tennis golf hockey happening in different parts of the world is it a better world compared to where it was in march 200% yes oh we can go on but <clears throat> sorry but the time is you know ticking and we need to come to a conclusion this has been a very uh, informative uh, informative prank and a very engaging conversation and it's heartwarming to see that there's a bright light uh, you know, at the end of the tunnel. I'm really hoping and wishing that COVID-19 will be dusted and done with, and all of us can move ahead as we were, you know, pre-COVID times. Thank you so much, Boria, for this conversation. And thank, uh, uh, heartful thanks to the Orange City Literature Festival for giving me this opportunity to have this very engaging conversation. Thank you once again. You know, all I will say in the end is when I watched, uh, I know India has lost the two games in Australia. Frankly, it doesn't matter to me. You know what mattered to me? At the Sydney Cricket Ground, there were about 15 to 20,000 yes. fans yes. watching both those games. And the rest of the games are also sold out to the degree that the Australian Cricket Board has allowed. So what does that mean? Gradually and very gradually, we are getting our lives back. Right. Fans, today, that the moment for the day was when this guy proposed to this woman uh, with a ring in that cricket venue and that for me stood out as the moment the world is getting its life back and that's because sport is happening that's what gives me hope i keep saying 2020 was an aberration 21 will be better amen thank you over to you anushi thank you sir and ma'am for that insightful conversation and uh, truly, it was really, really amazing to witness it. I am sure the audience was as delighted as I am to have been witnessing this conversation. And it truly gave me hope. Like, the world is really coming to life because sport is alive. And as a, as a part of a country that actually reveres sports as close to religion, it's really a great thing to know. And uh, with that, I feel deeply humbled and honored to have welcomed you into this session and to be now bidding adieu to you and uh, to everyone as this session brings the uh, third day and the final day of Orange City Literature Fest 2020 to a close. And uh, yes, before uh, saying goodbye, please lock your dates for the next season of Orange City Literature Fest. That is 26th, 27th and 28th November 2021. Uh, we'll be, we, will, we will be back with the same excitement and hopefully we might see you at the venue physically. Hopefully we should. And I shall be following you on Twitter, Boria, and keeping myself updated on the sport, sporting news. Thank you. Fingers crossed. It'll be a better world in 21 when all of us will not have to wear our N95 masks and have a meal together without having to bother if, uh, okay, who's sneezing, who's coughing, who's doing what. You know, <laughs> Never before has humanity been defeated by a pandemic, and it will not happen. Science will win, sport will win, life will win. So 21, fingers crossed, I should be in Nagpur celebrating with you all. Love the positivity. Yes, but goodbyes needn't be, uh, you know, dull. We don't need to say just goodbye. We have a fun-filled evening for everyone who has attended the Modern City Literature Fest today. And in the past days, we have a musical evening by Mame Khan, which will again be live like this session. The link will be there on the website. And uh, yes, goodbye, everyone. Thank you for attending you with much. us. And I hope everyone has a lovely evening ahead. Stay happy, Thank stay you. safe. Have a great Thank day. you so much. Bye-bye. 20 years of existence. Two universities, 23 educational institutes, offering 137 courses. Rysoni Group of Institutions, a vision beyond.